Welcome everyone as we come together to honor our Blessed Mother Mary, the flame of love of her Immaculate Heart, in this Mass of Our Lady, Mother of Fair Love, beautiful love, the beauty of divine love, is what she reflects. And in her messages, coming simultaneously from the heart of Jesus and Mary, we hear our call, our vocation of love, to become the blades whose dazzling light will blind Satan. This is the key miracle that Christ Jesus, through our Mother Mary, desires to accomplish in our souls. That the fire of God's love convert our hearts to be one with his heart. And that this conversion of healing grace is meant to spread like wildfire from one heart to another, beginning with ourselves. St. Paul said to his spiritual son, Timothy, I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, he says, I remind you to stir into flame the gift you received through the imposition of my hands. To stir into flame this gift of the Spirit that you received and the Spirit of God that we receive at our confirmation through the imposition of the bishop's hands is not a spirit of timidity, cowardice, lukewarmness, which we are inclined to, left to ourselves in our own fallen nature. Therefore, this fire of love doesn't necessarily happen automatically. In fact, it will often require a concerted act of faith and effort to stir into flame the gift and the effect of grace. And so we stir that with a living faith, which means a faith that has been given to us as the fruit of new life in the Lord, in the Spirit. The, a living faith comes from a spiritual new birth. So this living faith implies that there's been some encounter with the risen Christ in our life. And we know God to be real and alive and present in our midst. Not some fascinating story of history, not just a religious figure of the past, the living presence of Jesus with us as Emmanuel, tangible. This is the miracle with that flame that gets ignited in our soul, where Jesus Christ as risen Savior becomes alive. And his desires become our desires. His fire becomes our fire. And our number one desire, to be one with him. To become the blaze that burns in him. And this blaze that burns in Jesus that St. Francis of Assisi knew so well and longed to be one with and was, he desired that that fire that burned in the sacred heart of Jesus would burn in him. And that fire is his love for the Father, first and foremost. From before the foundation of the world, the blazing fire of his love for his Father. And the Holy Spirit is the essence and the summit of that love. That oneness with the Father that he refers to in his high priestly prayer as the glory that is his from before the foundation of the world and the glory that he entered into the world to give to us. The glory of his love in the Father and the Father's perfect love for him and his perfect love for the Father. This divine exchange of life between the Father and the Son in the synergy of the Holy Spirit. That's the fire that he came to cast upon the earth. Our oneness with God in whose image and likeness we are made. And that's the miracle. When that 
eternal fire of life, light, and love begins to burn in us on earth. The effects of this grace, the free gift of salvation, God's desire, God desires to give this to everyone, no exceptions. All humanity, he wants to draw to himself as he did at the cross in time and space. But this fire of his love, of his sacred heart on the cross burns eternally in heaven. And, his, and he desires that that same fire burn in us because in order to save souls, God has ordained to, so to speak, need us to accomplish his will. So to speak, because it's contradictory, God has no need of anything outside of himself. He is, I am who am, the source and summit of everything, who's not contingent on anyone. He doesn't, he's not in need of anything or anyone to complete him. He's the uncreated cause of everything and everything is meant, is, was created to return to be back one with him. And yet, in his, as, his nature as love, he desires to be in relationship. He desires to, as it were, dance with us, to have us cooperate with his work of salvation. Just as parents cooperate with God's work of creation, become co-creators in God in bearing children. So biologically, on the spiritual dimension, we are called to share in his mission of salvation, of saving souls. By our, by our life of faith, hope, and love. And the first way that we participate in his work of saving souls is simply by our desires by simply desiring more than anything. Head and shoulders far superior to anything there is to be wanted in this world to want oneness with him. Second to none. And then the second thing we want more than anything is that all may come to know him and love him. This is the miracle because it doesn't come from ourselves. It's supernatural. It's totally supernatural. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit. Remember when St. Peter acknowledged the face of God in Jesus Christ as not being a God, simply a godly man, but God made man, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the incarnate savior, as St. Paul communicated his Christology with more depth. And when he acknowledged Jesus as the living image of the eternal Father, Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood didn't teach you this. This didn't come from yourselves. You didn't figure this out on your own because you studied the law and the prophets. This is a gift from grace. The Holy Spirit gave you that understanding, that epiphany. The Holy Spirit brought about the miracle of that birth in you. It didn't come from you. My wind of the Spirit the wind of the Father blew into your soul and breathed life into you. And hence, you were able to discover my face as the perfect reflection of our Father. God desires all to know his Son as the source and summit of salvation, the one and only way to God. He desires all to come to his heart, the lukewarm and fallen away Catholics, atheists, agnostics, and Gnostics, those in the New Age who consider themselves, as I once did, spiritual but not religious, those in the LGBTQ culture, God wants everyone to know his love through faith and repentance. No one is excluded from the kingdom of God, but conversion is the key to enter. Everyone is welcome to convert and be united to God. Because what God offers is far greater than anything we could ever choose for ourselves. God desires and longs for the sanctification of priests, for the liberation of souls in purgatory, 
that we participate with him in making reparation for sin so that Satan's stronghold over society may be overcome. The Lord desires to open up the way of salvation, the floodgates of mercy for all, that all may be alive in new life. His life. Zoe. And we're to begin simply by setting the world ablaze with his burning desire. Even if you have nothing, even if you think you have nothing to offer, Father, I don't, I, I'm too old. My kids, I, I, they don't listen to me whenever I talk about the faith. I don't have that many friends. I can't even get to church. I can't even drive myself to church. The only thing I do is I, I'm at home with my aches and pains, praying the rosary all day. I don't pre I can't preach. I don't have contact with hardly anybody. What do I have to offer? A lot. Your heart, your desires, your sufferings. Become the blaze. Totally transformed in the blazing fire of God's love. This blazing fire is a healing and sanctifying. It's the glorification of our souls in the Holy Spirit. It's what the Eastern Church calls deification. What St. Peter in his second letter, chapter 1, refers to as our call and the excellence of the, of the promises of God's gospel. Our call to share in the divine nature of God. In the Eucharist, when mixing the water and wine in the chalice, the priest says a prayer in secret, in silence, saying, by the mingling of this, or the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. This was the mystery of the changing of water into wine at Cana. It wasn't simply saving the party from being spoiled because they ran out of wine. It was symbolic of this transformation that God, the bridegroom divine, was incarnate in the world to bring about this spiritual, mystical marriage of our humanity with God's divinity. And this wedding, this spousal communion between heaven and earth, this covenant, is all seen and personified in Christ. Christ is this covenant of communions, mystical marriage between heaven and earth, that is, God's divinity and our humanity. That's the fire that God wants to burn in our hearts, that purifies the world, that overcomes evil, that cleanses the world of Satan's effects, and as sin abounds in the world, God promises through the book of Romans and St. Paul's mouth, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And our blessed mother, the new Eve, the woman of the apocalypse, prophesied in Genesis 3.15, who crushes the head of the serpent in union with her son at the foot of the cross. This woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, this tw crowned with twelve, with 12 stars, this 12 star general of God's heavenly army. She is the one who says that through the flame of love of her immaculate heart, as ordained by Jesus and divine providence, that the greatest miracles that have ever happened in the world since the Word was made flesh would come to pass. She desires this blazing fire to live in us. And let us never forget that it's not simply a matter of keeping sp the specificities of the devotions. Yes, those are important frameworks for our living a fervent Christian life. And our Blessed Mother gives us the, the spiritual direction how to, on how to do so. But all that is a means to an end. And the end is the consummation of God's life in us. 
the number one goal is the Holy Spirit who has union with the Holy Spirit, communion with the Holy Spirit, who assimilates us to the holiness of God's heart, restores and magnifies who we are as the imagio Dei, the image of God. We who are made in the divine image of the, tr of the triune God's dynamism. We're made in the image and likeness of the Most Holy Trinity, who is this exchange of love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this synergy of life, this dance, as the Eastern Greek fathers referred to it, the parakleresis, this dance of the inner life of the Trinity, the synergy of God's grace and unity. The Holy Spirit, communion with the Holy Spirit is the goal. This is what one of the great mystics of the Eastern Church, St. Seraphim of Sarah, who was a contemporary of St. Therese, one of the greatest saints of modern times. St. Seraphim of Sarah referred to the goal of the spiritual life as being the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. What I'm referring to as the assimilation of our life in union with His. The Holy Spirit is the one that makes the risen Jesus alive to us, that makes the cross alive to us, that inspires us to live in alignment with God's will, that enlightens, illumines our mind to have a greater, more keenful insight into God's will and God's word and God's wisdom in order to live in His way, in His truth, in His life. It's the Holy Spirit of Jesus that is the pioneer, or the, the source of our living faith, of our new birth. And the Holy Spirit is the essence and summit of love itself. The glory that Jesus refers to in his high priestly prayer, John 17. The Holy Spirit is the consummation of the perfect unity of who God is in pure simplicity. The unity of the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit is the unity of the Son with us, the Church. The Holy Spirit is the soul of the Church that unites us to Jesus, our head. And it's the Holy Spirit who draws humanity into the heart of God, primarily and essentially through the sacramental life of the Church. It's the mission of the Holy Spirit to bring about what's called the recapitulation of all things in Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who brings about the sanctification of the whole cosmos. Remember, St. Paul says in the letter to the Galatians, to the Romans, chapter 8, all creation is groaning and longing for the revelation of the children of God, the glorious freedom of the children of God. All creation somehow has been made to share in that deification. And the human person, as the image of God, is the agent of that, of God bringing that about. But the greatest fulcrum of it is the Eucharist. The mission of the Son and the Holy Spirit is the work of the risen Lord through the sacramental life of the church. When we look at the heart of Jesus, the heart of Jesus is a symbol of God's incarnate and boundless love for all humanity, of God's superabundance of extravagant, lavish love for humanity at the at a tremendous cost to himself. The unequivocal expression of God's total love for us is Christ on the cross, the King of glory. What humility. That God loves us so much that he put everything on the line 
everything at stake. His humble love is so radical, so unprecedented, inconceivably, almost even we could say ridiculous. The madness of divine love is a scandal to those who are religious but lack living faith in the Holy Spirit. A scandal to Jews, a scandal to religious pagans, a scandal to Muslims. They see our Christ on the cross and they say, you worship him? You say that's God? What God would do that? What God would be, would be so foolish to let himself be humiliated and suffer to that extent? supernatural God. We didn't make it up. It's an inconceivable love that he revealed that exceeds our, all of our expectations. Even the expectations of his children and people. It exceeded the expectations of the prophets. The book of Hebrews said, angels long to look into the, these sacred mysteries of what God has revealed through his incarnation, cross, and resurrection. God put his life on the line in so many ways, even at the expense of making him look incredible. As the Muslims do. The Muslims see us worshiping Jesus as God on the cross, and they're like, uh-uh. There's no way God could do that. That's too much. Not for God. Nothing is too much for God. What does it matter of? He is the king of glory on the cross. As John's gospel testifies, whenever he referred to his hour, he referred to it as his glory. And that whole section of the, of the gospel of John is referred to as the book of glory. And the first section is the book of signs, pointing to it through miracles. Christ's love, there is no greater love in the universe than this. Our faith. And Jesus, crucified and risen. There's no greater love in the whole universe. You will find no greater love, no greater revelation in any religion. You could spend your whole life looking for something better. You're not going to find it. And yet for us who brought up as Catholics, we could easily take it for granted. We have no idea what we've been given. Until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes. And then once our eyes of our hearts are opened, then when we, that's when we start to worship. That's when we worship in spirit and truth. Christ's love is victorious. Christ's love that was consummated on the cross conquers all. Conquers Satan. That's what he came in the world to do. God said in Sinai, I am who am. Satan says, I am not. As Archbishop Sheen would often say and point out. Christ came into the world to conquer the works of Satan and he himself and his offspring, sin and death. Christ in the Eucharist is the mystical extension of his incarnation. Christ in the Eucharist is the sacramental representation of this victory of the cross. The victory of love over death, love over evil, life over death. At Mass, we become mystically present at the foot of the cross. This most important moment in history, this saving event that is ever alive in eternal life before the face of the Father as the risen Son intercedes for us before Him. The Lamb once slain but standing before the throne of grace as is seen in the book of Revelation. We become mystically present to Christ crucified and risen at Mass with the closeness with God that incomparably exceeds anything we could have 
ever conceived or accomplished for ourselves. It's at the Mass that we are called to become the blaze, the blazing fire of God's love. Where God desires to glorify our soul and the Holy Spirit, to deify us. And the closer we live to the furnace of His heart, the more we will be set on fire. The more we live united to the heart of Christ in the Eucharist, the more we will be able to be an instrument, a minister, an ambassador of his fire in the hearts of others. And the number one model of, of imparting this fire of love is Mary. The unity prayer that, we, that was given to us through Elizabeth Kindleman by way of Jesus himself, this unity prayer expresses our invitation to enter into Mary's perfect union with the heart of her son. Jesus and Mary possessed one heart. Just as when Jesus was in the heart, in the womb of Mary, they were in one body, their hearts that were united in that physical oneness was mystically present forever in their lives and especially now in eternity. And we are invited into this oneness of Jesus and Mary, this oneness of divine intimacy that we're made for. As we pray in this unity prayer, may our souls be as one in perfect harmony that we can say with Mary, his heart is my heart, and my heart is his heart. We are one. Jesus said that not only to our, but in reference to our Blessed Mother, but he even said that to St. Gertrude the Great, the first to receive revelations of the Sacred Heart before it was formalized through St. Margaret Mary. And this begins, as I said, with desire, wanting this gift. And second, obedience. Obedience of the will. Surrendering ourselves to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and uniting ourselves with his heart there. Uniting our hearts to Christ's perfect obedience on the cross. This is the sacrifice that saves his gift of himself on the cross. When we unite the gift of ourselves to the gift of himself at Calvary in an obedience of our will with his, that act of faith in the obedience of love saves, ushers in grace to make us new with God's Spirit. Therefore, we want to conform ourselves to him who is the Most High. Because as the philosophers all knew so well, we become what we love. If I love with all my desire, with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, something or anything other than God, I conform the development of my personality in the image and likeness of that thing. My will becomes in alignment with that. Therefore, if that is of a dignity less than what I'm made for, then I'm selling myself short. But if I love, if the one that I love with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength is the highest principle of everything, the most high one and only God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, then like begets like. I become more and more like him the more my will is united to him. And that's ecstasy. That, that conformity, which our postmodern, woke um, culture that is all about anarchy and, and only will lead to chaos, that idea of conformity, conforming yourself to anything outside of your own will is a stumbling block. It's ridiculous. Because to the proud, that makes no sense. And that echoes the pride, the pride of not simply original sin, but the pride of the origin of sin, 
Satan who said, I will not serve. I will not conform myself to anything or anyone outside of what I want. That's a recipe for disaster and self-destruction. Ecstasy is to be willing to surrender ourselves, to come out of ourselves in order to truly find ourselves. And when we do that and surrender to God, the love of loves, that's the greatest ecstasy there is because God exalts the soul in himself and all he asks is the humility to believe and to obey. And when we shed the skin of our false self and our ego in obedience to him, then we become exalted more than we ever could in, in whatever way we try to seek happiness on our own terms. As we celebrate this Eucharist, we acknowledge, as St. Maximilian Kolbe did, that modern times are dominated by Satan and will be more so in the future. The conflict with hell cannot be engaged by human strength or the most clever. The Immaculata alone has from God the promise of victory over Satan. However, assumed into heaven, the Mother of God now requires our cooperation. She seeks souls who will consecrate themselves entirely to her, will become in her hands effective instruments for the defeat of Satan and the spreading of God's kingdom upon earth. Through the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the intercession of so many saints that were ablaze with the dazzling light of this love, St. Max, St. Therese, St. Seraphim, St. Padre Pio, the list goes on and on. It's these saints, our own brothers and sisters and friends in high places, that cheer us on to follow in their footsteps and to allow God's miracles to be accomplished in our lives. <laughs>